Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. I'm Bo Mircha, associate pastor here, and I want to welcome you into this holy place. I was thinking about the time that Moses goes into the desert and sees the burning bush. And God says to him, take off your shoes. This is a holy place. I keep thinking about that because it kind of captures our understanding of coming into the presence of God. It is a place where we are invited to know who God is. At the end of that conversation, Moses knows about God, that God is the I am. At the end of that conversation, Moses' life is changed. He has a purpose. He has to go to Egypt. His life is changed and transformed. And every time for us, when we come to this holy place to be in the presence of God, we are invited to the same thing, to discover more of who God is, to discover our lives in the light of God's love and out of the transformation to go out in the world. So I want to welcome you in this holy place. If you're at home, you can take your shoes off enjoy the time that God has for us this morning, but even more so, bring yourself before God and let his transforming fire change you once again. Would you pray with me? Lord, we give you thanks for your love, a love that reaches out to us in the most unexpected ways, in the, mo in the most unexpected times. We ask you, Lord, that the time that we spend together as a community spread across a city, a country, a world, we, we pray that your love not only will bring us closer to each other, but closer to you. And in that love, we can see who you are. So Lord, be with us in this time of worship, in this time of prayer, in this time of singing. Let your love cherish our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a holy place. God reaches out to you and says, come. So I say to you, let's worship. The Lord is with you.
Morning, everybody. I hope you'll bring the kids near. I want to tell a story about kayaking, and I want to take you out on the Shamanwood Lake with me in a few moments. I was able to go out on the lake this week and visit with my turtle friends once again. You'll remember back in the spring, we went out on the lake together, and you saw my turtle friends, and now I want you to see them again, and there are so many more of them. And so I hope that you'll be able to count them as you see me out on the water and look at the big tree that's lying down floating in the water and look at all the branches and I think there you're going to see some of my turtle friends and I encourage you to see if you can count all those turtles there's so many of them and you may even want your mom and dad to rewind this so that you can make sure you count all those turtles so you just watch and see the turtles Well, did you see all those turtles? Did you see how much the turtles grew over the summertime? And there's a lot more turtles now, but they were growing all summer long. And you know what? As I look at you, I think you've been growing over the summer too, and I think you'll continue to grow and get bigger. But you know, there are many ways to grow. We can grow bigger and taller, but we also can grow in what we know. We can grow smarter as we learn, and we can grow in our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope that in the days to come, you'll grow in how much you know about Jesus, and you'll grow in the love of Jesus. Jesus loves mercy. And Jesus tells us in Matthew's gospel when he calls Matthew to be a disciple. The reason he calls him is because he desires mercy. He wants to be merciful to people. So I hope that in the days to come, you'll grow in your love of Jesus as you follow him. And you will be able to say that I desire mercy, and I grow in mercy, and I show others the mercy of Jesus in how I live, and what I do, and what I say. So as you grow bigger, I hope you'll grow more in your knowledge and love of Jesus. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the wonder of the outdoors, being able to see your creatures, such as these turtles that are growing. And Lord, as we grow and get bigger, we pray that we would grow in you, grow in your spirit, grow in your love and your grace, and become more like Jesus each and every day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that you get to go out on the lake someday. Let us continue our worship. Community updates. By now, you know it's one of my favorite things to share with you, in part because it just kind of brings us as a community together and tells us what God is doing in our lives. This past week, we had a great tailgate a fellowship. Uh, we had probably the most people that uh, we had so far. And it was so fun to see people and talk to people and engage in conversation, have a good meal, but even more so to catch up about life. And I think those type of moments are precious to all of us. So I want to encourage you to find your own tailgate party with, with your friends from church. Uh, give them a phone call and see what God is doing in their lives. This week I want to talk to you about a few things. One of that, the most important one probably is October 17th is coming up. And as you know, the Mission Council is uh, planning on doing a serve day at the Northern Illinois Food Bank by Sam's Club in Joliet. So if you want to be part of that, it's going to be on October 17th from 9 a.m. to about 11.30. We ask you to call the church office so we can get the registrations in and send uh, our uh, reservations. So please, October 17th from 9 to 11.30, Northern Illinois Food Bank, we're serving together. Uh, the other thing that uh, 
uh, I want to talk to you about today is uh, Celebrate Wonder. That's the Sunday School curriculum for the children. Parents, you should receive, if you have not received already, a letter from us that has uh, the first uh, lesson, kind of uh, a sample of what we're going to be doing, but also instructions to how to set up all the classrooms and and everything else. But most important part of that letter is we need you to respond to us on an email so we can uh, provide you uh, the information going forward with that. So Celebrate Wonder, it, it's a fun curriculum. The, we start with creation and we're, we're just uh, kind of discovering how God created the this beautiful planet we are on, but also how God created us people and what it means to us. So there's there's some very good stuff coming up out of that. So I'll encourage you to uh, look for that letter and uh, respond to us. Now, next Sunday, the 27th, is going to be a big Sunday here at First Press. And there are a couple of reasons why. One is uh, the bell choir is going to be playing. So that is in itself a big, big win, right? It's a big step going forward because for so long we have not seen them because of all the things going on. So the second part is we're going to have a baptism uh, on, on that Sunday. So I have to tell you, the, the reservation for the Sunday service are already getting very, very uh, slim. So if you are planning on attending the 27th, we need you to call ahead, make a reservation, not just for a Sunday, but for every Sunday. Make a reservation ahead of time because that helps us plan properly and helps us uh, have a good service in order and uh, taking care of everybody for, uh, for everybody's safety. So there are exciting things coming up. So uh, I hope that uh, I hope to share with you the bell choir playing uh, in the coming weeks, but even more so right now, as I said, look at your calendar, check if you're planning to be here on the 27th, and make that phone call to the office or send us an email. You have a great week. I will see you next week. Take care.
and saving God, we thank you for the good news of new life that you bring us. Thank you for your saving mercies. May we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading comes from Matthew 9, 9 through 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn from what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. We give so that the mercy, love, and forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ that lives in us may be evident in the world. There are four ways that you can give to the ministry of First Presbyterian Church. You can mail in your offerings. You can go online and use the Give tab. You can contact our treasurer and use electronic giving. Or you can come and worship with us at our live worship service and give in person. Let us give graciously and with joy because of the mercy, grace, and goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ that lives within us. Now I invite you to please pray with me. First silently that you might say your own prayers and then I'll lead us in prayer. Please pray with me. Lord God, as summer fades into fall, we are reminded that the seasons come and go year after year while you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You are the one true eternal God. Your faithfulness, loving kindness, mercy, forgiveness live and endure always. We thank you for making them so clear and abundantly evident in and through the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that your Holy Spirit Live within us and make these things evident in our lives, a very part of the fabric of how we live and what we say and what we do. We pray for those who suffer sickness and we ask whatever sickness they may have that you would make them whole and well. We pray for those who suffer economic disparities and deprivation that you would Give them economic wholeness. We pray for racial injustice, that there would be justice. We pray for the fires in the West, that they would cease and more rains would come and things would be much better. Lord, we pray for the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for healing and hope and medicines and vaccines and that this pandemic would lift. Lord of all, hear our prayers for a more just, good, kind, gracious, and loving society, nation, and world. Work in and through each of us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now let us continue our morning worship. <laughs>
I have wall art in my home that says, may your trails be crooked and winding, leading to the most amazing view. And I love this particular piece of art because when I see it, it reminds me who I belong to. I belong to Jesus Christ. Not because I'm all that great. I mean, the reality is I've spent time on crooked and winding trails. But Jesus is all that great. And here's the thing. Jesus meets us where we are. Jesus can meet us right in the middle of that crooked trail. I know that's where he met me. And here's another thing. Jesus doesn't leave us unchanged. Faith in Christ changes a person in, in wonderful ways, in, in really hard ways, in slow ways, in unexpected ways, in amazing ways. Jesus can, should we choose to follow him, lead us off that crooked trail onto a path that ends at this amazing view, this view of Jesus, this view of the world through his eyes. And the Apostle Paul, he served Jesus well. No other person on this earth other than Jesus shaped the history of Christianity like Paul did. Paul spread the good news of the gospel across the Roman Empire on three separate missionary journeys. These journeys were hard. They were not comfy and cozy. And when he couldn't meet with people in person, he wrote letters. He wrote letters encouraging churches, encouraging Christians to stay strong in their belief, to share that belief with other people. Letters like the one that we're going to read today. Yet Paul also traveled a crooked and winding path before he took that stroll on the road to Damascus where he met Jesus. So we're going to take just a, a small look at part of Paul's story in a letter that he wrote to Timothy. We're reading 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20 this morning. My friends, hear God's word for you today. Paul wrote, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that it deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive, eter receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then Paul went on to write, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So when's our New Testament reading today? My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Paul, the Apostle Paul was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence. And he was those things he wrote because he acted out of ignorance and unbelief. This was before his conversion. Now, as an aside, I just... I just want to mention quickly that that faith in Jesus doesn't mean we become perfect. It doesn't, it doesn't erase our ability to sin. And even Paul wrote in Romans 7, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. 
See, none of us, none of us can just wipe out all the sin in our lives on our own. Not one of us can be free from sin. But nonetheless, Christ redeems us. Because of Christ, we are forgiven for all of it. And Christ in, in us enables us bit by bit to repent. He enables us to turn away from those, those things that we find on that winding path and put our eyes on God and spend more and more time doing the things that God has called us to do in this world. Things like love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others. So Paul was not someone we would think of as, as a good guy before he encountered the grace and mercy and love of Jesus. In fact, Paul really was rather a showcase for the profound change that Jesus can bring about in one's life. But then again, aren't we all rather a showcase in that way? You know, when we read scripture, we learn about God's vast love for us, for this world. And we also learn about God's law. We learn what the requirements are, what he wants us to do, how he wants us to live, how he commands us to live. And as we read that, we recognize that we can't do it. We can't dot all those I's and cross all those T's because we're humans and we live in a, in a fallen world. And so when we read about that, we recognize that, that we need, we need a savior. And that then brings us back to the love that God has for us, the love, the love that meant he sent Jesus into this world to save the likes of us. When we think about Paul, do we think of him as a, as a bad guy? Was he a good guy? Was he the worst? Was he the, was he the best? Was he somewhere in between all of these things? I mean, Paul was, as he wrote to his protege, young Tim, a blasphemer. Now, a blasphemer is a person who insults or shows contempt for God or sacred things. And he was a persecutor. He locked Christians up in, in prison. He, he searched for them far and wide. And Paul, he was a man of violence. He approved of the stoning of Stephen when Stephen gave a strong statement about his Christian faith. And we can read in Acts that Paul ravaged the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. Paul was not somebody we probably would want to invite to the Wednesday night potluck or the Wednesday night tailgate in the church parking lot. At least not when Paul was Saul. That was before that was before Paul experienced God's mercy. Paul told Timothy in our passage today, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Not because Paul was Paul, but because God is God. As commentator Walter Liefeld wrote, the blessings of God are so big, they're so extensive, that we might tend to forget that we're not saved only for our own benefit, but we are saved for the glory of God. Let's think for a minute about grace. Let's think about, about God's grace. So I looked the word grace up in the dictionary, and one of the definitions that I found is that grace is a manifestation of favor, especially by a superior. I thought, why, yes. Yes, it is. But God's grace is so much bigger than that. God's grace is transformative. You remember a little while ago I said that when we meet Jesus, when we choose to follow Jesus, we are never left unchanged. Philip Yancey was once asked to define this grace, and he said that he never tries to define grace. It's, it's too big. But he did share a story. He said, he said he remembered once getting stuck in traffic in Los Angeles. He was on his way back to the airport. And when he finally got to the rental car counter and dropped his keys down, he was almost an hour late. Well, he looked at the woman and he said, okay, how much is the penalty that I owe? And the woman said, there's no charge. And Philip said, well, what do you mean there's no charge? I'm late. The woman said, well, we have an hour grace period. And Philip said, he looked at this woman and he said, well, what is grace? And she said, I, I don't know. I, I guess what it means is even though you're supposed to pay, you don't have to. Even though you're supposed to pay, you don't have to. Paul was supposed to pay 
for being a blasphemer, but he didn't have to. Paul was supposed to pay for being a persecutor, but he didn't have to. Paul was supposed to pay for being a man of violence, but he didn't have to. Instead, the grace of our Lord overflowed for him with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul received mercy and went on to become a staunch leader in the first century church, boldly sharing the gospel wherever he went. And when he couldn't go, he wrote. So important to him that he share Jesus with people and that people share Jesus with people. God's grace is so big, it's so undeserved, it's so incredible that it really, it really can't be defined. I can't think of words that would define it adequately. But this grace, it's very costly. Remember the cross. This grace comes at the foot of the cross where Jesus died for our sins. This grace is available because Jesus died because we walk on crooked trails. And then Jesus rose again. And this kind of grace, it just doesn't make a lot of sense if people are let off the hook and then they go right back to the trail that they were let off of. I mean, imagine if Paul went back to blaspheming, persecuting, and being violent. But he didn't. He chose to follow God in faith. Mercy came from God. Strength came from God. Paul followed in faith. And more often than not, people who receive grace and mercy are grateful. They're so grateful that they begin to change. Now, this isn't immediate. We don't become entirely different people overnight, at least not, not typically. But when people have received the grace of Jesus, they begin to live so that others can see Jesus working in them. Jesus changed my life. In fact, I was attending First Press when I met Jesus on my winding trail. And you know, personal experience speaks loudly, maybe especially now in the current culture, in the current time. I mean, I don't know of anybody who decided to get to know Jesus because someone walked up and bashed them on the side of the head with their Bible. But I do think that through time, and through relationship, that others may come to want to know how our lives are changed or why we do what we do or, or how we have the strength to love even the most unlovable by these world standards or how we get through the hardest things that life throws at us because life throws some pretty tough things once in a while. This kind of change, it comes not through our own strength, it comes through the strength of God. God's grace doesn't just free us, it lifts us, it empowers us, it changes us. And this grace thing, it's, it's central to God's plan. And get this, this grace thing, it's for everyone. It's for everyone. It doesn't matter how crooked the trail we're on has become. It doesn't matter even if we've wandered back on to that trail. Each of us can be let off the hook because Jesus Christ came into this world to save us. All we have to do is trust in him and let him work in our lives like he worked in Paul's. When we put our faith in Jesus, we learn that we've become part of God's plan to save the world. It becomes about so much more than just us as individual people. Paul discovered this, which is why he said that Jesus chose him precisely because he was the worst. He said, for that reason, I received mercy so that in me as a foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. That was verse 16 of our reading this morning. Paul was not shown mercy because Paul deserved it. Paul was shown mercy precisely because he didn't deserve it. It came as a pure gift and it was given to him to reveal to the people of the world that Christ loves to save sinners. 
And Paul was grateful for this mercy and grace, and so he responded by becoming one of the greatest leaders in the early church. This former blasphemer, persecutor, and man of violence showed his gratitude by turning his life around and serving the very same Christians that he had hurt. Now, we're not going to become Paul. I mean, Paul is Paul. You and I are, are you and I, we're different. But God has plans for each of us because a church full of Pauls just isn't going to be very effective. A church full of Pauls isn't going to be able to come together and do the work that God has for them to do. But a church that's made up of, of a Craig and a Bo and a Chris and a Jackie and an Emma and a Bev and a Mark and an Ed and so on and so on is a strong church. That's a strong church when it's made up of many different believers who have been redeemed on many different paths by Jesus. God's grace and mercy were abundantly available for Paul and they're abundantly available for us. Even when we're feeling badly about ourselves, even when we've wandered off the path, Jesus always loves us. And it's important, I think, in those moments to remember that this grace isn't just about us. It's about God's plan for the world. And so it doesn't matter if we're having a day where we feel like we're the worst friend, husband, wife, neighbor, parent, child, employee. Maybe we've done something pretty rotten. Doesn't matter. We're never beyond God's grace. No matter who we are, or what we've done, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ overflows for us with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Jesus wants to show us how to live a life that will reveal Christ to the world. And so like the Apostle Paul, we can become an example to those who would become to believe in Jesus for eternal life. Maya Angelou said, do the best you can until you know better. Then, when you know better, do better. And by the grace of God, we have the capacity to learn better all the time. The Christian life is about continual growth and continual love. 2020 has not been among the greatest of years. It's not been an easy year, and I can't say that 2021 will be any better. I don't know what that year will hold. But here's what I do know. God is with us. He is still with us. He is always with us. And his grace lifts us. He still empowers us to be people of love. Love for him and love for one another. For one another. We are the church. We are Christ's body here on this earth. And we are called to care for one another and to care for the people God created. We are called to learn and grow, to be stronger together even when we're apart. And now, maybe more than ever, we have to focus on Jesus so that we can be his hands and feet in this world, so that we can, as a church body, help the people around us, so that we as a church body can bring glory to God, and so that we as a church body can bring his love into an angry world. My friends, I, I want to encourage you this morning, I want, you, I want to encourage you to read scripture. I encourage you to pray big, to pray small. I encourage you to remember that even when we stumble back onto a crooked trail, Jesus meets us there. And because Jesus meets us there, the view is always amazing, even in 2020. May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen.